Hi, here is today's reading. It's from Luke chapter 24, reading the first nine verses. Jesus has risen. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to the others. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, thank you, Chris, for bringing us the reading from Luke 24. What a fantastic account of the resurrection of Jesus and God's provision and kindness. And what an incredible question that's embedded in the heart of it. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? And we're going to come back to a few different ways of thinking about that question. Now, why are you looking for the living among the dead? Why do we spend so much time looking for living things amongst the dead and the passing and the dying things? So we're going to have a few flyovers and hopefully by the end of this there'll be some really rich resourceful things uh, for you to take into the week and the months and maybe the next year in front of you. So welcome to you this morning as we take this journey of reflection and communion uh, prepared for church at home for Sunday, August the 30th, 2020. And it's beautiful to sit outside today in, in warmth and in stillness and amongst the birds and I can hear that buzzing of the solar panels in the background as well charging the system. Um, what a beautiful day to sit outside in after the, the wet and the storms and the high winds we have experienced over the last week or so. so welcome to you if you need to get elements for communion it's a good time to do that now if you need a bible with you it's a good time to just pause and grab one now as well lots of things that the lord brings to my account i find that as the week unfolds there are lots of things that the lord brings to my mind to consider and to kind of put together a bit like a jigsaw piece i think sunday by sunday as i prepare the messages and think about you know um what has god been saying to me because if nothing else i think Preaching and sharing has to be an authentic experience of your own particular journey through the week that's been um, as you reflect about the way that God speaks through different people. And today I really want to thank uh, Cliff Nunn. Uh, Cliff uh, very faithfully, day by day, puts up Bible readings out on uh, email that I think a lot of you might have signed up for. And I just take a couple of occasions during the week when time allows to write a brief reflection around them. Uh, Cliff put up one just recently that I just want to um, come to and just read to you. It seems like maybe it's a long way from today's reading from Luke 24, but hopefully by the end of a reflection on this, you'll see how the Lord has really been speaking about a range of things that are gonna tie in it into our communion just a little bit later on. So the reading that came up for last Sunday that Cliff had put up uh, came from Isaiah 61 verse 10. Isaiah 61 verse 10. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of his righteousness. As a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. That's from Isaiah 61 10. And then I spent some time praying and reflecting around uh, that, those, that particular verse and what impact it had on me and hopefully what impact it might have on you today, particularly as we look at the reading from Luke 24, which seems to have nothing to do with clothes. But as I've been doing my walking and reflecting and praying during the week, it seems to have everything to do with what we actually are covered in covered in, what kind of story, what kind of narrative we inhabit, what kind of way we see the world, what kind of eyes and ears and heart we bring to the world that's around us. So I'm just going to read a little bit of the reflection that I wrote for Cliff that went out on the email uh, last uh, Sunday night. 
There are clothes for all kinds of occasions. Probably every wardrobe is full of them. There are clothes for weddings, for work, for being a nurse, for soldiering, for council work, for gardening, for swimming, maybe for getting married and even for being buried. I wonder what garments we're wearing today. Maybe in COVID-19 isolation, we might have odd socks, if any socks on, carpet slippers, tracky dacks, a food stained t-shirt and a dressing gown, lockdown attire worn possibly for weeks, comfortable in the unseen places, but wildly inappropriate if you go down to the shops. This reflection from Isaiah is about the garment, about the covering of your life. It is a metaphorical image of quite significant power as we wind our way through scripture and all the wonder of garments that are washed clean in the power of renewal and the transformative power of Christ. Revelation 22 verse 14 says, those who wash their clothes clean are happy, those who wash in the blood of the lamb. They will have the right to go into the city through the gates. They will have the right to eat the fruit of the tree of life. All of our lives can be easily understood as a garment, the self that we pull on every day. Our old clothes, the coat of your youth, the pyjamas of our childhood, the vest of uncertainty, the underpants of shame, the gloves of disappointment, the cap of, hope, of hopefulness are all on display for those with discerning eyes to see. I find this a very powerful image. I like that idea of waking up out of forgetfulness of sleep and dressing, so, dressing ourselves again in the comfortable continuity of what has been our life, even if it is ill-fitting, scratchy, in need of washing, repairs, or is no longer even fit for purpose. We often drag ourselves around from decade to decade, dressed in the fashion of the past, threadbare for the present and hopelessly inadequate for the future. Isaiah points us to a very different kind of garment. What would it look like to be clothed in salvation, arrayed in righteousness and adorned as a priest and a bride, as a conduit of blessing to the world? Or what might it look like for us to be dressed in what Isaiah 61.3 expresses, to be dressed in a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair? So thanks Cliff again for posting those readings so faithfully every night and for giving me and others the chance, I know John Sargent often presses into these too, and others, um, the, the chance to actually sit and reflect and take ourselves through a prayerful walk through these readings as well. That image of uh, the garment has been very powerful for me and I do think about the way that we kind of uh, wake up out of sleep every day and, and pull on the garment of our life, to pull on our memories and our experiences and off we go into the world, kind of a refashioned um, kind of re-representation of what we were yesterday and the day before and the day before that. Now there's nothing wrong with that, that in one sense that is what consistency is about. So people can recognise us, we're not wildly different every single day. But then again, you know, sometimes the garment that we pull on, the garment that we hold to is pretty shabby. It is um, something from the past. It is no longer really serviceable and it doesn't really cover us in the way um, that it really should. And I think about that again back into Luke 24. I know it doesn't say much about garments or clothing, but you know, I, I picture um, these women coming to the tomb on this uh, Resurrection Sunday. And they don't know it's Resurrection Sunday. They've come uh, with, with tears and with wailing and with sobbing, with as other scriptures have said other gospels you know they've come with the ointments and with the perfumes that really befit the, the honoring of the dead and they've come to honor jesus they've come to honor the one that they've grown to love and to revere they've come in the in the shame and the bereavement and the shock of the crucifixion just a couple of days beforehand and, and they've come maybe even in fear because they know that the authorities have been brutal about um, those who follow Jesus. They, they want all of these understandings completely squashed and quashed and done away with. So I think about what they must have been thinking that day as they got up, as they dragged on their lives, their clothing, 
of bereavement and grief and also their clothing of honour and they made their way to the place of the tomb where they knew that Jesus had been laid and they'd brought all of those things to to bathe and to wash and to just hold his uh, dead deceased body and to bathe him with tears and with perfume and as they approach um, the tomb as other gospels say that a stone's been rolled away maybe their minds have now been filled with a new kind of terror because in the ancient world you know the desecration of a body was the key way to just drive home a message that we we own you and we have defeated you that's why the, there were those terrible things that actually have or have lasted right into the 21st century with the awful atrocities that happen when there's terrorism where bodies are left out held up displayed decapitated there are so many ways where those who see themselves as strong uh, actually display their absolute um, weakness as they desecrate those who've been assassinated killed and destroyed in the ancient world uh, that was very strong Head, heads on pikes bodies held up you know in the end the roman empire did away with crucifixion because the the amount of um, complaint and horror as people had to make their way around along the roadways and see just cross after cross after cross after cross of he people who were hung there the criminals who were hung there as a message to everyone a bit like in rural Australia, a, a crow or a fox is um, put on a barbed wire fence as a sign and a symbol to other animals, other crows, other foxes and to people. This is what we do to those things that we find to be vermin and terrible. So I don't know what was going in the minds of those women. But what happens is um, God's kindness has gone before them. And it's a beautiful consistency, I think, in Luke's Gospel. At the very beginning, we meet the angelic presence who comes to Mary with a powerful message of, you're going to be the bearer of the Saviour into the world. And now at this point, as the women approach the tomb, with all of those things going on in, in their minds and their heart and, and their tears, uh, they become aware of these two dazzling men in, in white, iridescent white. We might think of them as angels, think of them as messengers, but th this scripture is really clear. Here, here are recognisable people and they are radiant. And their words to the women are incredibly comforting because before they have to fill the gaps with their own theatre of the mind. Uh, you know, theatre of the mind, it's when, uh, and we, we all do the theatre of the mind. Someone says they want to talk to you. And suddenly the theatre of the mind says, oh, I've done something really wrong. I'm going to be in trouble. Maybe I'll get sacked. Um, why do they want to talk to me? Um, are they going to tell me news I don't want to hear? So we often uh, can leap ahead, filling in all the gaps. That's what our minds do. We fill the gaps. In the absence of information, we'll fill it with the theatre of the mind. So I love the kindness of God who puts these messengers there to just stop the women from going into a dark and a gloomy place. Have they stole, stolen the body? What have they done to Jesus now? Are we going to find him hanging up on a wall somewhere? No, the words from these dazzling men are, why, why are you looking for the living among the dead? He's not here. He's arisen just as he said he has. And then you find the whole demeanour of the women has changed. There's something about the message that's now in them. And I know the Gospels all reflect on this in different ways. Uh, they all uh, recall different things that the women had experienced or one of them might have experienced. In John's Gospel, it's Mary encountering the gardener, the one she thinks is the gardener, and then it's the word from Jesus. But I, I, I love this because there's a, a transformation in the nature of their lives. And when I think about the nature of the garment, this is like um, taking away that garment of, of heaviness and replacing it with a garment of praise and with song and with joy, taking away the garment of sadness and the garment of despair and the garment of loss and the garment of uh, what's going to happen next, the garment of turmoil, the garment of bereavement, the garment of tears. Now that's replaced with a garment of expectation and and of delight and and wonder um, when will they see Jesus and so their legs now carry them into this new awakening of actually the, the Lord is risen and so when I think about the communion that we share uh, and I love sharing it week by week in fact I love the idea of communion every day in fact scripture says whenever you meet whenever you're having breakfast or lunch or tea together bring something of the communion with you 
um, because I think this communion really speaks to me of a new kind of garment. And what I love about communion is you do have to pause and stop. So you might even want to do that now. If you need to get um, bread and, and a cup to share, why don't we do that? So when I take communion, and probably for all of us it's different, there's lots of different seasons of communion for me, lots of different ways of thinking about what Jesus' words to me are today, in this season, in COVID-19, in for tomorrow, whatever's required. I think about the need to pause. And this is a bit like uh, me waking up of a morning. What, what clothing will I pull on? Is it going to be just the old pair of jeans and t-shirt thrown hastily under the bed or in some other place um, that I just put on and drag on the old clothes? The old way of doing things, you know, the old world of sin and death, the old world of disappointment, or maybe like those women going to the tomb, you know, wearing the clothing of deep grief and deep mourning because, you know, this is what the world does to you. You find one who seems to be the saviour and, and friend and son of God and the world can't wait to kill and to bury. So I think about the change in them as they hear those words. Why are you seeking the living among the dead? This meal says to me, John, um, do not waste your time looking for life amongst things that don't matter. No, stop just amusing yourself to death over trivialities and things that are quite meaningless and stupid. And that doesn't mean I've got to be walking around with, you know, um, looking for wise things every day. I love random humour. I love laughing like anyone. I love ridiculous and stupid things. But in the very core of my being, um, this meal says there are, there are bigger things and there are greater things. It says to me, uh, John, don't wear the garment of endless criticism or cynicism. Don't wear the garment of hatred and of blame or of shaming others or of making up cruel nicknames for people. Don't, don't wear the garment that puts people down. Now this bread that you take in and eat, this is the body of Christ that is given for you. This is the teaching, the walking, the living and the breathing of the ministry of Jesus to the street that is meant to be a new garment, a new kind of clothing for us to wear. And this cup, speaks to a great sacrifice, the sacrifice of deep love and deep honour to take away all the sins of the world and to bear them and to carry them so that a new kind of clothing comes to you. I know it sounds like a weird kind of image, but there's something about the way in which our lives actually reflect the inner clothing that we wear. If we are clothed in the rags of shame, somehow we'll display that to the world no matter how much we want to cover it up. If we are wearing the garment of endless criticism and endless bagging out of others and just whinging and moaning, you know, we, can, we can pretend we're as Christian as we like, but if we're not wearing the clothing of the quickness to forgive and the quickness to restore and the quickness to reconcile, then we're actually wearing some other kind of garment. I think about this in relation to the Apostle Paul. And when he goes to Damascus with that letter um, from others in authority in Jerusalem to go and arrest Christians. And we've already met him at the stoning of Stephen. And we know he'll hold the cloaks of others who are doing all the dirty work. And off he goes. He, he can't wait to go and, and do what he thinks is the right thing to arrest these rene renegade people who are following this dead Messiah, Jesus. And on his way, and some of you will know the account really well, he is suddenly off his horse, he hears that voice, you know, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And his life is now changed. He finds that his eyes are affected and he finally makes his way to Damascus as a very different kind of man than the proud one who rode out from Jerusalem. And unknown to him, except through the word of the Lord later on, uh, a man, Ananias, a faithful follower of Jesus, receives a message from God. Words that come to him and say, um, Ananias, I want you to go down to Straight Street. You're going to find this guy, Saul. Uh, yeah, you know about him, and Ananias does. He doesn't want to go. He uh, feels that um, maybe it's a trap. Maybe this is what Paul will do. This is what Saul changes his name to Paul. This is what Saul will do. It, it, it's, it's a trap that's been laid there to capture me in some way. But what Ananias does is he doesn't 
He doesn't put on that old garment of um, mistrust or of hatred or of fear. Instead, he pulls on a garment that is full of uh, praise and full of joy and he makes his journey down to Straight Street and he does find Saul and he does pray for him and Saul has his eyes opened and there's uh, the wonder of baptism and and what we learn in this, in, in this meal, in the words of Jesus, in the following of the Saviour, that this is a new kind of garment to wear out into the world. It's not a priestly robe, it's not a big funny hat, it's not a collar around the neck, it, it is the clothing that you wear that reveals the righteousness of the Lord, the forgiveness of the Lord that is moving and thriving in you. Now I don't know whether you've noticed, but this world needs clothing that is like that. People clothed in the resplendent wonder of the resurrected Jesus. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? Why are you looking for life among the dead and the passing things? Why are you looking for life out of the remains and ashes of yesterday when the Lord has gone before you to Jerusalem and to the ends of the earth? Let's pray and then we'll share in the bread and the cup. Lord God, I really want to thank you for your kindness, your kindness to those women who in fear and trembling went to a tomb and found two dazzling men who brought them a message of great hope, that in fact the Lord was risen, no longer dead, and now their feet would carry them in a very different way into a very different world. Lord, I pray today for that to be brought into our lives as well through this bread and this cup that you would anoint this meal through the power of the Holy Spirit to continue to open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts, flood our spirit with the joy and the hope that comes with resurrection power. Help us Lord to set aside the old clothes of sin and death and help us Lord to put on the new garments of praise and of joy and hope. We live in a world that has seriously lost its way. Great nations that have fallen and become dens of liars and thieves. Lord, help us to pray well, lovingly, for those who seem to have lost their way as I've lost my way and as others lose their ways. Lord, we're under pressure every day with false news and conspiracies and stupidity. So Lord, help us to hold to your living word, to your living grace, to your way and your walk, to reveal the fresh and new things of the kingdom of God into the world around us. So Lord, bless us as we eat and as we drink. In your name. Amen. Why seek the living among the dead? Jesus took bread and broke it and he said, take and eat. This is my body and it is given for the all of you. Every nation, every tongue. Let's eat together. Likewise, having given thanks, Jesus took the cup and he said, take and drink. This is my blood, the blood of the new covenant, the new promise that is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sin. So take and drink as we anticipate meeting the Lord this week, as we anticipate a new world that is coming, as we find ourselves in work of reconciliation and justice, in love for the poor and the needy, in prayerfulness, in acts of great kindness that reveal the clothing that we wear, the inside clothing of hope. Let's drink together. And may God bless you this week. Be encouraged by the women at the tomb. Be encouraged by the reading from Isaiah around the new kind of clothing. You might even have some fun this week, just trying to either sketch out or write or draw. Now, what's the clothing that you put on every day? The stuff that you drag from under the bed, from the back of the wardrobe. Um, not the actual clothes, but those metaphorical clothes. The clothes that you think make you. And just consider for a moment, um, what, what kind of clothing would be better to wear in this season, in this time? God bless you.